Um, so like finding something interesting that you can share and add to conversation that isn't just like, oh, I'm so busy. You're busy too. Oh yeah, I'm good. Oh, you're good too. <laughs> oh, the absolute worst. It's when you're driven, the need to accomplish a goal is relentless. Hard work and ambition compel you to do whatever's necessary. In my work as a personal injury trial lawyer for 18 years, it's common to meet driven people. Those with drive can have different personalities, careers, or backgrounds, but they possess one common factor. Despite their passions, driven people want to surround and motivate themselves with other driven people. If you want to learn how to overcome obstacles by learning from others, then tune in here. This is the Driven Crowd Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to episode 42 of the Driven Crowd podcast, fueled by Snellings Law. I'm your host, Scott Snellings. My guest today is founder of Juris Consult Institute. Molly Huff is a business development coach and loves teaching women attorneys how to build a book of business and to provide meaningful connections with each other so that they can all earn more money and gain more control and autonomy over their careers. Molly's mission goes beyond training and development, though. She's here to create a community of like-minded women who can change the legal profession and their careers for the better. Molly, welcome to the Driven Crowd podcast. Thank you, Scott. I feel honored to be on episode 42. So that thank is a you lot, for right? Me here. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for being on. Um, so I met you on LinkedIn and yep. we uh, we had some some Zoom conversations because you were not in Texas. You were up in the cold, cold north of Minnesota. I am, but it is thanks to El Nino this year. We are in 50 degree weather, so I'm happy as can be. <laughs> I, I bet. I had a friend that moved up to Minnesota. He used to be an associate pastor at our church. And his first year there, we were all just like, oh my gosh, are you going to make it? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. But then the spring but then the spring and summer rolled around. He was like, no, this is actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's so funny. I never in a million years thought I'd up end up in Minnesota. Uh, but I love it. I it's kind of the joke that once you move here, it's really hard to move away from here because people like it so much. So do I like the cold? No, not very much. But that's when you just get to go visit Texas or Arizona or something like that. So it's not too bad. That's right. Yeah. Well, we had a cold snap here uh, a week or two ago, and we all just stay inside. We don't go do anything. If it's that cold, we all just stay inside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So walk us through, kind of give us a breakdown of where'd you grow up and how did you get to where you are? Yeah. So I... Uh, I'm a California girl uh, who grew up in Colorado Springs. Um, and so growing up in Colorado Springs was great. It's beautiful. Uh, but I also was just like craving independence really immediately as most high schoolers are. So I moved out pretty quickly and I moved to Washington State for college. Uh, it was there that I got a degree that was basically I didn't know what I was doing. So I got a communications degree. <laughs> Well, coming uh, from a psychology then, and then major I had here. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then I had like three minors, which all equates to, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so from there, uh, I got the really cool opportunity to uh, work for a few years at a nonprofit. I thought I was going to be in the nonprofit space uh, for most of my career. Uh, I got in there and I hated it. <laughs> it was so not for me. And I think really quickly, I had to learn the difference between being personally fulfilled and being professionally fulfilled. Oh. Um, and not to say that you can't have both of those things in a job. Um, but I think it's silly that we are asking people to like always find that perfect sweet spot for a job. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I had to like work some of that out for myself and I have always been very ambitious. I've always been very driven. Uh, and I like just being challenged intellectually. And so uh, it was really, I just needed to find something else that could fulfill that side of me. And I got the really cool opportunity to go and be a young women's delegate at the UN for two years and like advocate for women's rights and, and just meet these incredible people and be in these incredible spaces. And uh, it was through that, that everyone I met was either a states person who was previously a lawyer or was already a lawyer. <laughs> Oh, wow. And so it just sort of opened my brain. Like I didn't grow up around lawyers. I grew up with a single mom who was a janitor and a school teacher. 
So I like, it just was not in my realm of possibility. And uh, the minute I went there, I just felt like my whole world expanded, uh, which is the power of, I think, getting in the room and being around people who are doing big things. Like your mind just opens up in a really unique way. Yes. And it was from there that I came back from that experience and was like, I think I'm going to go to law school. <laughs> Uh, and so from there, you know, I did the whole spiel and applied to law school and uh, came out here to Minnesota for law school uh, and thought I was going to do my three years in the Midwest and head to like D.C. or New York again. Um, and they just they got me. I loved it here. <laughs> you got sucked in. I got sucked in. I totally did. Um so I don't know, Scott, did you did you take time off before you went to law school or did you go straight in? Uh, well, I did, but that was because I got a delayed entry into the school that I really wanted to go to, which which is Baylor. Um, and so, yeah, I just basically had a fifth year of college, except I didn't go to class. Um, I bartended for that year. So I graduated and then basically had an extra year where I was just bartending at night. And it was fantastic. Uh, I loved it. And talk about um, having to develop social skills right? I was a server before that. And then I became a bartender. It's hard enough when the people are sober to deal with them. And then you throw in a bunch of drunk people and all of a sudden it's like, okay, yeah, you really have to learn your communication skills there. But um, yeah, you know, I, I took that year off and it was really, really good for me. I think it had I gone straight through without a break, I don't know that I would have, have done as well, quite frankly. I don't know how people do it. I was exhausted at the end of college. <laughs> I needed a break. Um, and yeah, so I think after um, after I did my you know three years at law school, um, I was lucky enough to get an OCI job. Um, and actually, I shouldn't say that. I wasn't lucky. I worked really hard to get an OCI job. There I'm trying go. to change that, Scott. You yeah, frame that right. Yeah, that's right. Um, I worked really hard for that. And so I got an OCI job. So I was kind of one of the few that had a job after graduation, uh, which I did not take for granted and just sort of jumped into litigation. And, you know, your entire first year is like so overwhelming because <laughs> you're quickly realizing how little you know. Right. And uh, it's not just enough to have the hard skills, but to learn all the you know, tips and tricks and how to practice well and what your style of practicing is and all that sort of stuff. So I quickly realized that business development was my sort of like key to success here. <laughs> I think I was never going to be like the appellate attorney, um, but I was really good at making relationships with people and being consistent. And so through that, very quickly, um, I got a big book of business, uh, which was awesome. Um, and through like that experience, I had a lot of people coming to me being like, how are you doing this? What is this looking like? Like, And I realized that I was coaching people without getting paid. <laughs> right. And then right. I quickly realized like, okay, I've got to start getting paid for my time here. Um, and also this is aligns with my strengths aligns with my values of um, valuing women and pouring into women and seeing so many smart, talented, ambitious women leave the law because of barriers to business development. And I just, I was having enough of that. And so, you know, I always say like, I can't solve misogyny. I can't solve sexism, um, but I can put some more money in women's pockets uh, and that's something I care about deeply. And so, uh, that's how all of this launched and got created. And, uh, it has been so much fun. <laughs> like, I don't know if you feel that way, Scott, about not only like owning your own practice, but doing this podcast and like the brand you have online, but it's just fun. It, it really is because it's challenging, but it's something that I love doing. And you, you started off talking about the difference between personal and professional fulfillment and all of the things that we do from, from the law firm to the podcast to the service projects and the community initiatives. I absolutely love all those things. And so my professional cup is, is overflowing. Personally, I enjoy a lot of it too, but I, I'm separate, right? And I think one of the things that a lot of people do as lawyers, especially, is they identify as, well, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. That's who I am. And it's like, no, no, that is, that is what you do. That is not who you are. 
And so I think that was a huge distinction you made in terms of identifying those things. And I think it goes directly to the business development side of things too, right? As you meet new people, if all you are is a lawyer, you're not a very interesting person. Yeah, I was that person for the first two years of being an attorney. I made being an attorney my entire personality and like that sucks. Nobody enjoys that. Uh, so it took some time for me to kind of like get my own life back and get my personality back. Um, but I think once I started, stop trying to fit into this like corporate male attorney box. Uh, Cause I was trying to fit into that for a very long time from everything from like the clothes that I wore um, to how I spoke to how aggressive I felt like I had to be. Um, you know, especially in the litigator world, it just was really out of alignment with who I am. And it just took some time of like learning more about myself and how I wanted to show up in the legal profession uh, for me to be, you know, feminine, strong, not bullied, <laughs> um, and also just showing up as my sort of um, true self. That took some time to get to. I mean, I don't know if you experienced that, Scott, like if it took time for you to sort of figure out, um, you know, how you want to show up in this profession. Absolutely. And I think everybody struggles with that, right? Because we all have these preconceived notions of what it's like to be a lawyer, especially some sort of a trial lawyer, whatever mm -hmm. that looks like. Everybody wants to be the bulldog, right? And so that's not my personality. I'm yeah. not going to get run over, but I'm not going to go be a jerk to be a jerk. That's no fun. That's not how I want to live my life. But at the same time, when you're coming into the profession, you know, none of these things are talked about in law school. And quite mm -hmm. frankly, a lot of the law school professors kind of have that same stigma around them, even though I had several amazing uh, trial lawyers in, in our uh, school. But yeah, you're not only realizing that you really have no idea what you're doing and you're pouring all of your time, effort and energy into figuring that part out, but you're yep. also trying to act the part which is why I think so many, especially first, second, third year lawyers have this massive imposter syndrome because we're trying to inspire confidence when internally we know that there's no confidence to be had. We're in the process right. of figuring that part out. Right. And I think that is like one of the biggest gifts that you can give an attorney, a newer attorney, is building their confidence. I find that a lot of firms take, like they take from your confidence and it's just so backwards in how we should be building attorneys. Um, and I think this is also a really good lesson, Scott, of, I remember getting a call from someone uh, who asked me to handle their case and they had talked about how aggressive they wanted to be and you know they needed like the bulldog. And I was very comfortable with myself at this point to say, I'm not your person, I'm not the bulldog, but I'd love to get you in touch with the bulldog. <laughs> Um, and like going into that whole like referral network and just being able to like hand that off to somebody because that's not who I wanted to be as a lawyer. And again, not being like bullied or pushed around or anything like that. But I was like, we're just not the right fit. Absolutely. And it cracks me up too, because whenever you get into what they really want, say, hey, you can have a bulldog and that's going to extend litigation. It's going to make things a lot more expensive. Or you can have somebody who can get along with the other side, get you fantastic results in a shorter and, and cheaper amount of time. Yeah, I like I think <laughs> all of those conversations happen and sometimes you just get that person who's out of alignment with you and you know, it's just as important to learn to say no to certain clients, um, which is really hard to do as a new attorney when you're building a book because you just want to capture everything. Um, but that's something I work with my clients on a lot is just saying, is this really in alignment with what you're trying to do and what you're trying to build? Um, if not, let's use this as an opportunity to either refer to someone else in your firm or refer it to someone to like get that origination credit um, or to refer it to somebody else that you have a good referral relationship with. But let's stay in alignment with where you're trying to, to go here. Absolutely. Uh, saying no is, is even more important than saying yes on so many different occasions. Uh, all right. So let's, let's talk networking. That is, that is your area, right? Uh, so I don't know about you, but in high school and college and law school, I don't know that I ever heard the word networking. And it's certainly the importance of it was not stressed whatsoever. No, not at all. <laughs> I mean, it was not stressed to me until I went to law school. And then all of a sudden it was like, network, 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 network. And I was like, I don't, 
really know what that means. And also I feel like I have nothing to like add value to anybody right now, which was not true, but I think that's sort of how that feels as kind of a first year law student or, or anybody as a law student. Um, so can I share my theme for this year? Yes. Like what I've got going on for myself share this away. year. So my theme for this year is get in the room. Um, and I think, and you'll connect with this, Scott, but I am just so in this space of being incredibly captivated and um, wanting to be as close as possible to people doing big things and creative things and different things. And I just want to be in the room with them so that I can learn from them, be challenged by them, be inspired um, by them, add value to them. And I think that's just something that we miss out on us a lot as attorneys is we get into this space where it's like, I'm either networked to build a book or I'm networking to um, get out of my firm <laughs> or to like, yes. get a different job, you know, <laughs> and you're missing so much of this like incredible community of lawyers who were doing incredible, big, different, unique things. And I just want to be around as many of them as possible. And so, and so that's, that's my theme for this year. So I, I mean, I have meetings booked out quite far at this point because I'm just asking all of these people who are inspiring me um, if I can spend some time with them and get into rooms with them and be near them. And it is the coolest thing ever. And I think once you start doing that, it's also really amazing to see how little people say no. Um, like, I think it will surprise people if you're like, oh my gosh, it's the, I don't know, look, it's the general counsel of Target. Like, I can never be near them. It's like, yes, right. you can. <laughs> you can be near them. Um, so that's my theme for this year, which goes into our conversation about networking, because I think when we think of networking, especially for women, it feels really gross and icky and exhausting. Also, it's like another thing we have to do rather than this like source of inspiration for us of just like finding your people. Um, so that's my theme for this year. I, I love it. I love it. I think it's spot on. You know, I'm in two different mastermind groups now. Uh, I've been in one for a while. And quite frankly, one of the absolute best things about being in a mastermind group is the people you surround yourself with. Yep. I guarantee you, if you asked anybody in the mastermind group, you know, why are you willing to pay this not inexpensive amount of money to yeah, go meet investment. you know every quarter or or month or however often they are it's going to say because every time i leave i have some amazing ideas of course that i've heard from others but i'm inspired mm -hmm. it fills my cup i get to be around like-minded people who are driven who are optimistic who are encouraging and i get to ask whatever question i want to regardless of if it's dumb uh, it doesn't matter because they all know that I'm there for the same reason as them. And that's to, to grow, to get better, to learn. And right. I think whenever you take that ego and you set it aside and yeah. you go into a room with the expectation of, man, I want to be inspired, mm -hmm. then that just opens so many more things up. Like you said, opens up your mind to become inspired and to learn. So one of the values of mine and my business is that I want every single person to walk away with more than when they walked in. And that's the power of masterminds and getting around your people. Uh, so for instance, my coaching kitchen events, this is like an in intimate dinner party experience where we come and we're, um, uh, we have this like beautiful three course meal and every, you know, dish is introduced and, um, prepared by this, uh, female chef and business owner. Uh, and it's meant to be, a relationship building event for women um, who are used to showing up to legal events that take from them. And this one gives to them. And that's what all of my programs do. So my masterminds, my one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, all the spaces that I show up in, that's always my goal is that people are leaving with more than when they walked in. And I think that's a really good gauge for when you're networking. Like, did this person take from me or did we were we able to give to each other? Was I able to walk away um, with something more than when I walked in? Uh, and yes, there's certain things you got to just do. But when you're thinking about finding your people, that's got to be a gauge. Absolutely. Uh, so 
in terms of the the adding value or the the takers, I love that. The, are they adding or are they taking? Mm-hmm. We all know the people who are takers. They're the ones who show up. Hey, do you have a tchotchke vendor? Buy my tchotchkes, hand you a card and walk off. And while they're talking to you, they're looking over your shoulder for the next victim, right? Yep, exactly. Uh, um, and so what are some key things that you suggest to people who are looking to get out and network? Say they're going to a wide open event, right? So some sort of a, a networking event where they don't know anybody. Mm-hmm. What are some solid first steps in that situation? Yeah. Well, first I would ask them why they're showing up in, a, in that space. I think I would go back a step and say, why are you showing up here? Does this align with your strengths? If it doesn't align with your strengths, we should probably try to find a different space for you. Um, but if this does align with your strengths and this is like a good space for you to be in, Um, I think you've got to do your prep work beforehand. So if there's nobody that you know, like, did you do your homework and look at, you know, who's going to be at this event and identify two to three people that you really want to make contact with and make some um, initial connection with. Uh, So there's got to be some prep on the front end. If none of that is available and we've got some of these good things going for us of like the strengths are aligning, this is where you want to be. um, There's people in this room that you can connect with. Uh, I think a really good mentality to go in with is um, this mentality that A, you deserve to take up space um, in that room. Mm. So stop trying to shrink yourself by not being noticed in that room. Um, You deserve to be there and you have something to give to the people that are in that room. I think second is you've got to just go up and start introducing yourself. Like if this is really the space you want to be in, um, just go up and make an introduction And I would also share to not immediately say, um, you know, my name is Molly Huff and I'm an in-house attorney. Uh, You know, find something interesting to say about yourself as a way to connect on like a human being level rather than just a work level with that person. Um, So, for instance, I do kickboxing three to four times a week. Um, And so... I always use that or will work that into a conversation and people always run, run up with it. They're like, Oh wow. Kickboxing. (laughs) Um, Or they let, you know, or they're like, Oh, I could never do that. Um, So like finding something interesting that you can share and add to conversation that isn't just like, Oh, I'm so busy. You're busy too. Oh yeah. I'm good. Oh, you're good too. (laughs) Oh, the absolute worst. It's just, and there it's not memorable. It's not sticky. So I talk to my clients a lot about sticky language. Um, And so what are the things that you are leaving with others that's going to stick with them? If you tell me, if I meet another commercial litigator, I I don't care. I don't know what a commercial litigator does. I don't know what that means for you. And I have no idea how that's going to help me. But if we're getting into conversation about, um, you know, what you do, like if we're at that point and instead you say something like, um, Oh man, well, you know how um uh in all of these NDAs, this certain section is is always out of whack. <laughs> well, I'm the person that can help you fix that. Um, or uh, you know how you have to update your employee handbooks every year. Well, I'm the person that's gonna help you do that. Um, just something stickier that is actually solving a specific problem for them, rather than this like general. I'm a commercial litigator. Like, I'm not going to remember that. That means nothing to me or my business. Um, So you got to find something sticky as well. So I'm rambling a little bit now, but I think my point is you've got to do the prep work. You got to make sure that you're in the room for the right reasons. If you're in the room for the right reasons, then take up space, find some sticky language and use something interesting about yourself when you're engaging. I love that. And I, th- I think the planning part is missed by so many different people. When you say networking, it's, oh man, Scott's example. You got to go into this big room of, of these scary people you don't know anything about. And no, no, a ton no. of people would be terrible in that situation, right? Especially if it's not even people that you need to know. Totally. And I find so many of my clients are exhausted by networking because they're showing up in all the wrong spaces. 
Um, and so they're like showing up to these networking events that it's like, oh my gosh, I just spent an hour and a half and had to organize childcare and I had to, you know, stay in these stupid heels for another hour and a half. And I had to, <laughs> you know, drive all the way downtown and find parking and then pay for parking. And, you know, it's just, and then show up in this space where I walked away and all I talked about was how busy I was with right. other people. Yeah. Like, that sucks. Nobody wants that. Um, so you've got to do the prep work and you've got to find the right spaces that you want to show up in. Um, and I think people f- like are following these like quote unquote business development rules because that's what we've been told to do. And, and I find with my clients, with my success and my clients see a ton of success um, that the opposite is true. Yeah. And you posted on that this morning on LinkedIn, you know, break the rules. The, the rules are, are not rules. You don't have to follow those. No, not at all. And, but it's so easy to get stuck in that, Scott. Like, I think so, because it happens to everyone almost until you really start getting into it. You're like, oh, well, I guess I should just write this article on this subject. Like, well, is that going to get in front of your clients? Is that actually interesting to you? Are you a good writer? Um, (laughs) Like, sure, let's find some strategic places to put this. Uh, but otherwise, this is a huge waste of time. Um, I'd much rather you go and like, uh, I was just talking to, I don't know if you know Patrick Patino, the like hoodie lawyer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've seen it. I don't know him, but I have seen him. Yes. Yeah. He's great. We were, we were chatting yesterday at lunch and um, we were like, yeah, like why aren't people, you know, in these like small towns, like um, hosting a, you know, a hot dog stand at Friday night football or like sponsoring the team, or there's so many spaces that people can show up in and what they're already doing. Uh, we're just not thinking about it very creatively. And so I was talking with my law partner who was on an episode, gosh, I don't even know how many episodes ago now, but we were talking about networking and I was asking her, you know, how she's been so successful in it. She's like, you got to find something you like doing or you won't do it. And networking, you can't just treat it as a one-off opportunity. So talk to us a little bit about being consistent and the follow-up. Yeah, here's a really cool thing that I'll share from uh, my most recent mastermind. So I bring in um, guest experts to my mastermind. And one of the people that I always bring in is um, a senior in-house leader of some kind. And... In this last mastermind, this really big light bulb went off for uh, some of the women in there. And the uh, in-house counsel said, I have so many women develop relationships with me and never make the ask for my business. And she was talking about how frustrating that is Mm. uh, because how easy it would be to say, hey, uh, you know, I am really interested in doing trademark law. You know, I'm a trademark attorney. If the opportunity ever comes up, I'd love to show you um, how I can do a good job for you. One sentence, simple, easy, making the ask, going back to the relationship after that. And how few women do it, like women are great at building the relationship, but they're not always good at making the ask. And so when you're talking about consistency and then like, you know, making that ask part, you got to have both. Um. And I think that's a really good light bulb moment for um, some women who are afraid to like feel icky or feel like they're, um, I don't know. I think it just feels icky for a lot of people. Uh, when it comes to consistency, the best thing I can tell anybody is you got to get accountability. If you are like most people, it will not happen. There's very few people who are so internally motivated that they can just do it. Um, that's a very rare person. Most people need a check-in once a week with accountability. Um, and if you don't have that, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to stay consistent. Um, especially when you're starting something new that's uncomfortable, it's going to be really easy to give up and you just got to find those people who can hold you accountable. Yeah, my wife is is one of those people who is absolutely amazing at consistency. That is her superpower. She is the one who has a network and reaches out to every single one of them consistently. And it's absolutely amazing to watch because I'm not. 
I have to have a system in place because my mind is all over the place, right? With the firm, with the kids, with the family, with all the stuff that we have going on, thinking about reaching out to a contact, whether a new one or an old one or friends even is so hard for me. So I have to build out kind of an accountability system, but a system that shows me, okay, you haven't reached out to this person in six months or a quarter or, hey, this level of contact, I need to be reaching out to them in some manner every month or every two months. Yeah, it's also amazing. Again, this is like goes into the accountability piece that people aren't tracking this. So when you're talking about systems, one of the things that I have a resource for my clients is um, I call it the badass tracker. There you <laughs> go. Uh, and it's truly a network mapping that shows you like exactly what you're talking about. You haven't followed up with this person in this many months. And it's like, it's got a wheel at the top. that's like tracking all of this for you. Um, so yeah, you've got to have some sort of system in place. And I think so many attorneys think because they're thinking about it or because it's like in their brain, it's somehow going to come to fruition. It's not. You got to get it on paper. Um, you got to get it out of your head uh, and you got to be strategic, right? Like your time is valuable. You can't just give everyone your time. Um, so you got to be strategic about it too, because I have no interest in burning anyone out. And to make this sustainable, you got to be strategic. So Molly, what about the piece, the people who they want to talk to everybody? I'm curious. I want to get to know everybody. I want to get to know the people who own the coffee shop. And I want to get to know the people who do X, Y, and Z because I'm curious and, and I want to be super involved in my community. How do you judge who the top ranking people that you should be networking with are? Yeah, you got to know who your client is. Um, if you don't know who your client is, if you haven't done the work to sit down and figure out who you want to serve, uh, it's going to feel very chaotic. And then because it's chaotic, it's going to feel frustrating. Um, and you're not going to be seeing much progress. You might get stuff like here and there that might kind of keep you going for a little bit. Um, but it's not going to be sustainable. So I think you've got to really drill down into who that ideal client is for you. Um, or even on the flip side, like even an area of law or an industry, like you've got to narrow it down somehow. And then from there, you've got to make decisions about, okay, well, do I want to spend time getting to know the coffee shop owner or do I want to spend time getting to know the gym owner? Because I am known as like the fitness attorney and right. I don't know, something like that. Um, so then you got to get really clear on that. <clears throat> and Scott, I don't know about you, but so many attorneys want to skip that step. And they also have no idea how to figure that out. Um, and so, but you've got to do both to be able to be strategic about who you're spending time with. And I think it's a great quality that you want to be, that you're the extrovert and you just like, like we've all met those people that could make friends with a brick wall. <laughs> yes. And they're wonderful, um, but they've got to focus in all at the same time. Um, so it's a great strength to have, and it's a great way to meet unexpected people. Um, but you still got to value your time. Uh, yeah. So that's how I would help someone sort of narrow that down. And Molly, I think that goes back to, I'll even take it a step further back. And most attorneys, they don't think about what am I trying to accomplish in my career overall? It is, Hey, I want to make partner or, Oh, I want to be you know, a great personal injury attorney, right? Well, mm -hmm. What does that look like? How do you know that you're on the right track? How do you know where you're going? And it's hard. It's hard to step back and create that vision. There's several vision books out there. Vivid Vision is really good to walk you through that process of creating it, but it's not easy. It's not something you can sit down, carve out four hours for, and then knock that off. No, not at all. Um, and Scott, you're like hitting on one of my high horses. <laughs> Well, step up on the soapbox. I'm, I'm going to step up on my soapbox here for a minute. Um, you, you nailed it. Attorneys, I think once attorneys graduate from law school, there is this thought that I don't have to um, do any more training and development because I have graduated and I'm practicing law now. There is this weird attorney thing that's like, I don't have to do any more for my career. Um, I just simply have to do good work 
maybe get in some business development and become partner. Um, and that is just so false. And so the attorneys that I find are the most successful are A, the attorneys that focus on one thing and B, the attorneys who have some vision for their life because they took time figuring out who they are. And I wish somebody could have come and, and shook me as a second year attorney. Yeah. And this is like what I'm doing online. I'm like shaking people <laughs> off. Um, to just say it's time to put some vision and inspiration back into your lungs. And we've got to figure out what that is. And it can't just be, I'm going to graduate, go to this firm, become partner, and then work there till I die. Uh, it's got to be more than that. And it's going to be such a fuller way to live your life. And so I hear you and I wish that more attorneys would catch some vision for how they want to show up in the legal profession. So Molly, let's jump into what you do for a living. Uh, Juris Consult, you, you recently rebranded and it's amazing out there. It looks fantastic. Walk us through for uh, any attorney, especially women attorneys who are looking to really enhance their business development. What would they reach out to you for? Yeah, so thanks for um, saying my branding looks good. It's been so fun. It's such a great <laughs> outlet for me and it's it's been a blast to do this rebrand. If women want to reach out to me, um, I work with attorneys who are um, associates looking to make partner, right? So they're like ready to like make that shift from I'm just an associate billing hours to the, okay, I'm 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 on the track to partnership and I've got to bring in some business. Um, or I work with the junior partner who has maybe had some luck with business development, but isn't getting any sort of consistency. Um, so that's when I kind of like notch your book of business up um, and get, sort of get it running on all cylinders. So I have a mastermind program um, that women can join. I have my new one is launching next week. Um, so I'm finishing up one in March and I'm launching another one in March. And this is truly for the attorney that's like, I don't know how to start, where to begin, who my client is. <laughs> like, I don't know any of it. This is the mastermind for you. Um, it is truly a six-month training and development program to get you up and running, to know exactly how to start building a book of business and getting clients in the door. And you'll also get you know, guest experts and all that sort of stuff. So we have business owners come in, we have in-house counsel come in um, and talk to you about like, this is what I want for my attorney. And this is what has like worked for me from getting um, like marketed to. So it's super valuable. Um, anyways, I could keep going on about the mastermind, but that's one really big way that people can work with me. And it's so much fun. And you get a uh, connection with other female attorneys who are also just like ambitious and get it and like have that drive to build that book of business. Um, that's your place to find those women. The other way that you can work with me is through one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, I'll tell you, I just signed up my final client yesterday. So I'm currently at capacity for one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, but you're welcome to join a wait list. Um, so when some other clients fall off, whenever that is, um, you're welcome to, to fill that spot up. Um, but you got to join the wait list because it goes to them first. So those are the big ways to work with me. And then if you're in the Twin Cities, uh, you're welcome to come to my dinner parties because uh, they are so much fun. So join me for a dinner party. Fantastic. That sounds amazing. It has to be so incredibly fulfilling as you work with these women and you see them go out and start executing on the business development. And I'm sure they're reaching back out saying, you'll never guess who I met or you'll never guess this kind of client. That just has to bring the biggest smile to your face. It is truly the coolest thing and I have the coolest job. So <laughs> I really encourage my clients um, to text me their wins. And so either email me their wins or text me their wins. And so I get these texts. I don't know when they're going to come in, right? That are random throughout the day. That's like, um, you know, I got my first client, which is like the most intoxicating feeling. Right. So, um, I'm going to hit six figures this, this month. Like this is the month I'm going to hit six figures. Um, or, you know, oh, I just got another referral from, you know, what we've been talking about or, it, it just, it brings me so much joy and I love that it's working. And I love that these women who, 
you know, I speak to a lot of women who are like, I don't think I should make the run for partnership. And I'm like, girl, <laughs> <laughs> no, we are, we are, we are putting the runway. We're putting the right things in place. You are worthy of taking up that space. It's time to go for partnership. Um, and to be able to say, you know, by the end of this year, I can't promise you a certain amount of clients. I can't promise you a certain amount of income, but I can promise you that you will become a business development, um, someone known for their business development. Uh, and that's going to be a huge uh, piece of becoming partner. And so, no, and thanks for asking that question. It's truly such a gift. And I work with the coolest, smartest women. Uh, so I have a pretty cool job, Scott. It sounds like it. And your passion for it shines through too. All right. One final question before we're out of time here. Give me three books, three of your favorite books. I don't know if I can give favorites, but I'll give some good ones that I just read. Okay. Um, really fun one that I just read was called Creating Superfans. And I think every lawyer should read that book. Uh, it's this woman who works with these, uh, you know, huge companies on how to create an excellent client journey. Mm. That is something that lawyers do not do. We think 100%. the administrative piece is the client journey. It is not. <laughs> And so how can you go above and beyond to create an excellent experience for your clients who are then going to give you referrals later on because they've turned into what she calls super fans. So it's people who want to go out and advocate for you because yeah. they've had such a good experience with you. Um, so I think that's a great one. Um, I just read Purple Cow. <laughs> Purple Cow. <laughs> okay. One? Yeah, I know that one. I know that one. Yeah, um, that was a pretty good one. Uh, just talking about how, like, how to be the purple cow. So how to be someone that is standing out and different from everyone else, uh, right? So this is, and it's written, um, I think, in a great context. And it's just talking about, like, especially in the lawyer world, don't be another commercial litigator. Like, think, even though you're doing commercial litigation, think about how you're being different. Yeah, right. And it's that sticky language we sort of talked about earlier. Um. Let's look at my bookshelf. Do you want to pick a book? I'm tr I can't I can't quite zoom in that far, but I've been looking at it the entire show, trying to yeah. figure out what what's on your shelves. Yeah, there's some really really good ones. Um, oh, another really good one. Um, You're invited. It's it's just talking about how to create. Um, how to create really incredible spaces and like sort of being the center of influence for people. Mm. Uh, and that's something that I work with most of my clients on is how to make the shift from, it's not just showing up in other people's spaces. It's how do you become the center of influence and how do you connect people to other people? Um, and, you know, how are you the person that's uh, the center of influence for all of these other people? Uh, and that's also a really powerful way to do business development. So awesome. yeah, so those are some. I don't think they're my favorites, um, but there's some really good ones that I've that I've read recently. Yeah, two of which I had never even heard of. So those will go on the list. So thank you uh -huh. very much for that. And thank you so yeah. much for joining us. I know you're a very busy lady and thank you so much for carving time out to be on the Driven Crowd podcast today. Yeah, Scott, thanks for asking. It's so fun to meet you. And I, you know, we've met before obviously, but... It's fun to have this conversation. I love what you're doing. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, the firm that you're creating, the brand that you're creating is is just really powerful. So thanks for being someone who is creative and doing things differently and, um, and just being you. Wow, well, I truly appreciate that. And I truly appreciate all of those tuning in to the Driven Crowd podcast today. And we will see you next time.